Hey guys, I'm David Holberton. We're here with Gypsy Artemis on the central mm -hmm. coast of New South Wales, Australia. This beautiful, magical spring afternoon. Mm. Um, we're just here to talk about Gypsy's journey at the moment. Yep. And mm -hmm. yeah, for for those of you. For those of you that don't know Gypsy, do you want to just tell people a little bit about some of the work that you do? Yep. Um, I do predominantly shamanic work in the world. Um, my focus at the moment is making shamanic medicine drums and rattles and drum beaters. But I've run things from fully naked dinners for women to work on body shame to women's circles, mixed gender circles, some plant medicine ceremonies. Um, what else? There's so many things. <laughs> Cacao, ecstatic dance. Um, yeah, just stuff focusing on being more ourselves and healing and just being more embodied in the world, I guess. Yeah. How did your shamanic journey start? Where did that all begin? Uh, I think, I think it started when I was a teenager, actually. Yeah. I really had a sense, I, I actually had a bout of depression when I was young and I used to think about suicide and the reason I didn't do it is that I had this really strong belief that if I did it then I would just be reincarnated to a baby who's like a day old and then I have to spend 15 years getting back to where I was so I was kind of like well there's no point suiciding because that's just a waste of this life that I've lived so far so I think that my spiritual beliefs really developed from that point on and I always had a yearning to understand my place in the world and that started with exploring religions like structured religions and then I found Buddhism which really was home for me and then once I found home I kind of um, explored more shamanic like plant a lot of plant medicines and um, yeah so that's and and doing a year studying at the school of shamanic midwifery as well that was pretty paramount to my um, my spiritual development and also apprenticing with ayahuasca mm. was a huge jump for me. So the shamanic midwifery yeah. is fascinating. Yeah, it is. Where where did you where did you do that? At the school of shamanic midwifery. So they were based down in the southern highlands, but they mostly work out of Mullumbimby now. Wow. So it's a year long course called the Four Seasons Journey, where you really learn the old ways, the old ways of women. Mm. and learning about menstru menstruation and moon phases and now you know the seasons and life phases and the psychical nature of life and um, yeah so that was really amazing actually um, that's when I changed my name so so different did I feel before and after mm. that I fully changed my name and kind of drew a line yeah, it's really interesting changing your name. Like, I really stopped being the old me and started being the new me. So that was in November 2013. Yeah. And I graduated in 2014. Yeah. And um, have you had the opportunity to be involved in the many shamanic birthing processes with women and families? Yeah, I have. I've done some birth photography and birth um, assistance. So I wasn't formally trained as a birth doula, but inevitably I would be photographing a birth and the woman has needed some assistance so I put the camera down and done the whole doula thing um, but I was also a deaf doula for a while but the, the culture wasn't ready so I gave that up and it's become more of an acceptable thing now but I just got on with other things but yeah I mean I love all the the transitional um, parts of life like li like birth and death mm -hmm. and menstruation and menopause um, yeah so and they're such important yeah. cycles. Yeah, they are, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been hugely interested in death and I've been working in that area probably since 2012. Yeah? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about some of your experiences in that in that realm? In, in doing that work mm. in, the, in, in the community, do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, well, I started running Death Cafe. I think I was the third person in Australia to ever run Death Cafe and... I was fortunate enough, the first one I ran down here in Edelong in, I think it might have been 2012, SBS came and filmed it and did a, little, did a little segment on the feed. So that got it really out in the open and um, lots of publicity. So I did Death Cafe almost monthly 
for a couple of years, we set up a little group on the Central Coast and every month we'd had a, have a different end of life um, event. So sometimes we'd um, watch a movie with an end of life theme and then have a discussion afterwards. Yeah. Sometimes we did Death Cafe, which was just a soft place to come and talk about end of life. Um, I wrote a workshop, a three three session workshop around end of life, like looking at what death means to us and what funeral, where the funerals are for the departed or the people mm. that we leave behind and things like that. So really, um, being that person who's opened the can of worms, if you will, and allowed people to talk about all the things death related that they just can't talk to their friends or their family about and. Um, and that's not necessarily people whose death is imminent. Mm. I, I don't think we've ever had anybody who's like got a diagnosis and is there because they're trying to get okay with dying. It's just like average mm. people like you and I who just, yeah. you know, um, want to have the conversation. It's maybe so, struggling to come to terms with their own mortality. Yeah, or there was a lot of parents who wanted to talk to their kids, a adult kids, about mm. their own death. And their kids were just like, no, I can't bear to think about you dying. So they could never have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah, so that was really amazing, and then I did some work for the Groundswell Project, which is an arts-based um, charity that uses arts to convey death, deathy, mm. deathy themes, to, to um, unpack deathy themes through the arts. Which culture do you reckon is doing it right in terms of... Oh, like places like India? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I just watched a beautiful doco the other day about, and I've been to India myself, and, and the gaps in Varanasi are a prime example mm. of, of a culture doing it well. I mean, if you're in Varanasi, you are absolutely certain that you will see a dead body, yeah. you know, just walking down the street with, you know, the family carrying them on their shoulders, wrapped up in, you know, and adorned in these beautiful um, fabrics and mm. stuff. And then they go down to the Ganges and have these beautiful ceremonies with you know, massive funeral pyre, and we just went and sat there and watched for the whole day. Wow. Actually, I don't think my partner at the time, we didn't speak a word through the whole thing. We were mm. just, like, gobsmacked and didn't speak. We were just speechless afterwards as wow. well. But, you know, it's so open, and I won't say in... I guess it is kind of in your face, but their culture deals with death, death so much that it's a given, Yeah. you know, but whereas we tuck it away and think it's never going to happen... And if we don't talk about it, then it won't happen and we'll just live forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I guess there's other cult, like the Nepalese would be similar. I'm sure there's lots of other um, countries who are doing far better than the Western countries are. Mm. Yeah. I remember being a kid and seeing my grandmother's dead body. Mm. And I was probably seven, seven or eight. I was yeah. quite young. But I refused to believe that she died. You know, I just mm. had such an emotional attachment. Yeah. Well, and just, I couldn't accept that. But... Mm. It, as soon as I touched her face and, and pulled her eyelid up, mm. I realised then that yeah. she was gone. She yeah, was not yeah. there. Yeah, and it was well. almost a whoa. It was a, it was a bit of a shock. Yeah, well, that must have been quite shocking. Oh, no, I've had the opposite experience. My um, great aunt died and my mum would not let me go to the funeral as a child. Mm. And I was so devastated that I wasn't allowed to go. And, I, you know, I didn't get that opportunity to see the dead body. So it wasn't until my mum died that I actually got to go and view a dead body. And yeah. you can see that that, who, that person who you knew and loved is no longer residing in that vessel. Exactly. You know, and I think that's paramount for kids getting coming to terms mm. with that, you know. Yeah. So I've let Treya, my daughter, who's almost 10, I've actively encouraged her to go to come to as many funerals as she possibly can. So she's seen dead bodies, like several dead bodies already. Mm. And she, I think it has helped her understand that, you know, that we clearly have departed. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you were saying before that when you started doing that work, the culture wasn't ready. Yeah. Um, have you noticed a bit of a transition, you know, with, with our culture here in the sort of the Western world? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, sorry, I just got distracted by that coming up on the yeah, screen. Um, home. what did you ask if, if I've noticed any changes in the, in the culture? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Because I mean, back in 2012, I sort of got my friend together and I said, we should be writing an end of life, um, like a death doula training course. Mm. We could have made an for absolute fortune because, of course, now they are emerging. That's what, that, eight years later. I just got sick of trying to push, push shit uphill, really. Like, I was there ready and the, the culture just wasn't ready. The hospitals weren't, you know, wanting to allow death doers into the space and they just didn't want to have the, even have the conversation so mm. I just got a little bit tired of that but yeah the conversations are being had and slowly 
things are changing. Like my therapist, who I saw last Friday, she said, oh, have you ever heard about a, of a death doula? And I was like, yeah, yeah. well, funny you should say that because I was one of the first ever death doulas to mm. set up a business. Um, but, yeah, I definitely I think that that death is coming back to the community, mm. Not much like birthing has come yeah. back home for home birthing. I think that death, deathing is coming home and coming back to the community. Mm. Like we've got down in Port Kembla, um, tender funerals have set up and they're a community-based sort of um, funeral home that are encouraging community and family to get more involved in the funeral itself. Yeah. So, you know, having, having it, whether that's having it at home or <clears throat> just running it yourself or having the body at home for mm. a day or two with a cooling bed. Um, so, yeah, I think that slowly it's changing. Yeah, I think yeah. it needs to. Yeah. Yep, I mean, I'd like to see a death doula present in every single hospital. Mm. That would be amazing. Yeah. I think we've got we've got a little way to go for that to happen, but that would be my ultimate vision. Yeah. yeah. And also, like, in when people are dying in hospital, that the family have some sort of education told what to expect I don't, I don't think that we did that very well that might have changed now because I haven't deathed anybody in a hospital for probably eight or ten years but yeah I think that there's a lot more that hospitals can be doing as well yeah yeah but places like tender I think are really helping to change the culture as well and ground to a project and places like that yeah it's like really that. great seeing this change yeah. you know move slowly into the community and mm. you know in such important important areas of development transition mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, as we're opening our culture up, you know, this mm. age of information, we're just so globally aware now. Yeah, that's true. And yeah. we're starting to see this equilibrium of understanding and tolerance, mm. and you know, asking those existential questions. <laughs> you know, yeah. how do we how do we kind of fit in with that? Yeah. With that greater sense of awareness. Yeah. And so, for those of you that don't know, um, Gypsies, we're about ten months into your own cancer journey. Oh, almost almost 12 months to the day actually really yeah so i got diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer so um it had spread from my breast into my lymph nodes and into many many bones mm. so too many to mention they don't need to be <laughs> mentioned but it's extensive but yeah. I, as far as i know it's not in any soft tissue so um the prognosis is probably three to five years but we also know that there are lots of women out there who are living a long time with it in their bones. Mm. So if I can keep it in my bones, then my life expectancy would be a lot longer. But as soon as it goes to tissues and like brain and organs and stuff, you're yeah, it's a whole other ball game. Yeah. So yeah, so hoping to keep it where it is. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well we we'll just yeah. kind of program that in. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, sure. Can you talk a little bit about? Um, just around the time of your diagnosis because you had a little bit of intuition about that I was with you that night but um, yeah yeah so I, I distinctly remember mm. you know the conversations you were having and yeah do you want to just run us through that yeah I mean I I've historically had thick breast tissue so lumps were not a new thing to me um, mm. but I felt a lump within a lump which as soon as I sort of felt it, it felt really, really hard, a bit like concrete. And as soon as I touched it, I was like, oh shit, I don't think this is good. Um, but then I was at a plant medicine ceremony and during the ceremony, the plant teacher told me that I had cancer and it showed me telling my children and telling the kid's dad, but it didn't show me how it ends. So it didn't show mm. me me dying or didn't show me anything about the path, but it clearly said, you have cancer and, um, and so, you know, I went to the doctor on the Monday and got um, got a biopsy. You know, I got an ultrasound done, and then you know, I just knew as mm -hmm. soon as as soon as I had I already had the idea. And then when the plant teacher showed me, then I was kind of like, this is for real. Yeah. Um, and then just went through the medical system, and within about within that week, I was fully diagnosed and on the path on the terrifying path <laughs> that is metastatic breast cancer. So. Yeah, so even though I knew within myself it was still, like, absolutely terrifying, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Mm, yeah, I'm just breathing deeply into that. Yeah. <laughs> Feeling the gravity of that. Yes. Awareness. Yeah. And, um, yeah, what were the, you know, what were the immediate recommendations and... 
around well, the prognosis and yeah i mean one when you get a diagnosis you're just sent on this really quick like everything happens really quickly and you're sent to this surgeon and you're sent here and you're sent there and you kind of it's a little bit of a whirlwind of a process but i mean mm. i journeyed with my mum 10 years prior so i knew the journey so i didn't have to like get used to the journey because it was familiar but you know it just is so fast so i was sent to a surgeon and i was booked in to have a mastectomy it you know my breast was taken off and then we were um you know seeing oncologists getting second opinions so it was all pretty quick but i i mean i i, I went into hospital a month after diagnosis mm -hmm. and then i didn't really st start treatment to a couple of months after that so i was pretty much doing not a lot or nothing you know not actively doing western treatment for probably two or three months after diagnosis so mm. that was a little bit scary feeling like we weren't doing anything but i kept being reassured that it was a slow growing cancer relatively slow compared to some of the more aggressive ones so yeah. um we had a little bit of time and space but i also was then seeing naturopaths and, mm. and seeing alternative doctors because i refused to do chemo yeah right from the start i've always refused to do chemo and my partner is um, supportive of that. The kid's dad and my sister as well are all, you know, not that they get to choose my treatment, but they've all said, you know, we understand why you don't want to do it and we fully mm. support you. Yeah. Yep. So I am doing some treatment. I've got um, an estrogen blocker to stop feeding the cancer yep. and also a targeted inhibitor, which just acts on the cancer cells and not every fast growing cell like, like normal chemo does. Yeah. So I haven't lost my hair and I haven't, I don't have constant nausea and I'm not feeling toxic mm. like I like and I and I fully know that if I did chemo that I would die from toxicity like I am that sensitive that yeah. I just know like watching my mum go through it I just know that I wouldn't survive it and it's not how I want to be remembered mm. you know I don't want my kids seeing me all puffy and on steroids and no hair and just not even looking like their mum you know yeah. If even if it meant that I die sooner, then I just want them to have the memory of me as a healthy person that I am now. That's so, great. And have you felt yeah. quite empowered about making your own decisions based around medication, treatments, yeah, yeah, I have. operations? Yeah, because I've been keeping an eye on some treatments. Because some of the treatments that my mum, I wanted my mum to do ten years ago, mm -hmm. were very much under the under the rug kind of you know not mainstream and they were actually difficult to yeah. access such as high dose vitamin c infusions but things have changed and i've over the years have kept an eye on things mm. such as vitamin c and it's far more accessible now so like i have high dose vitamin c injection every week um an infusion and you know that's hugely empowering and i and i even told my oncology team at gosford hospital that you know i'm not some ditzy hippie who's just making decisions willy-nilly mm. like i've been spending 10 years thinking about what i would do if i ever got cancer yeah you know and um and i outright told them just don't don't try and persuade me to do what you want me to do because that's yeah. not what i'm about i want you to support me and give me the research but don't try and push me into some treatment that i don't want and they've been amazing fantastic yeah they've been amazing it's um i think a really good thing for people to understand that mm. you know if um if they're given bad news like this that they they have got options and yeah and you're a lot still of yeah and you're still in command of your own body mm. you know yeah so yeah can you run us through like a little bit of around the support that you've been able to tap into well my community have been the most support like i have basically had to put out a call because when i was in hospital i was so ridiculously sick like i got admitted for pain management yeah. so I was in assessment ward for three and a half weeks I think and my pain was out of control like if you'd come and said I'll shoot you today Gypsy are you up for that I would have said yes like mm -hmm. that's how much pain I was in it was just excruciating um, but yeah we basically put a call out to friends and and even not friends we just put a like a blanket sort of call out on Facebook to say does anybody want to help and people I don't even know put their hands up to come and do stuff and people cooked and came like I didn't have a single night in the hospital where I didn't have someone staying great because I have a little bit of PTSD from my mum's death in Gosford Hospital so yep. um and I, I just know that I would have not fared very well at all if I was in there without my people with me so um we had a row to where people came and stayed mm. in the hospital and people were bringing meals and looking yep. after children and 
looking after the house and just pretty much doing everything while I tried to get out of there, really. Yeah. Can you shed a little bit of light on, on your mum's death? And yeah. And your journey of PTSD through that process? Yeah, mum died on the 1st of January 2008. So she um, had an eight-month journey with cancer. So she was almost dead when she got diagnosed, really. It was everywhere. Um, and so we had a very 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 bumpy ride with chemo and stuff like it nearly killed her they they bombarded her with some really really strong chemo just to try and you know keep her alive and we did get eight months but at a cost yeah yeah so she um i basically took time off work and was her carer and was in charge of her long list of medications and all that sort of stuff but um on bok no on new year's eve day I was with her and just looked at her and she'd sort of turned blue and so I phoned my um, nurse at Pal Care and we took her into hospital. In hindsight, I wish we'd just stayed at home and let her die there, but we went to hospital and she was admitted and died a week later. But she, because it was Christmas time, lots of staff mm. weren't there. The, the specialist oncologist wasn't there. It was really hard to get any support and consequently she started having seizures from her brain tumour so tumors so i would talk her through every single one of them like you're going to be okay mm. and just keep breathing and i can see that it pa it's passing and then i would walk outside and shut the door and i would just lose my shit <laughs> like it was like i sucked in all of her fear yep. and then would walk out and just vomited it out again and i just kept doing that and a friend would be out there hold literally holding me holding me up <laughs> and holding space for that and then i just get go and do it over and over again and so I have just, I can still see it now, just talking to you, the look on her of uh, utter fear on her face mm -hmm. when she's having seizures and um, just talking her through that and just how horrible it, it was. A, it was absolutely horrible. And then eventually they got hold of the oncologist and he, he prescribed medication to stop mm -hmm. the seizures. And he was very apologetic that we had to endure what we did, but it was really not a pretty death. And you know, her vomiting up all black stuff and it was really just not not good yeah so after that any i'm not so bad now but with any if i ever had any medical treatment even like going to the dentist i would have full flashbacks and mm. start crying and stuff like that so i'm I, it's a little bit i mean we're 10 years down the track so i'm a little bit better at it but you know having mri scans and ct scans and stuff i almost have a panic attack yeah yeah so it's not it's not awesome. <laughs> and so you've got one next week booked in, is I've that right? I've got an MRI in a week or two, yeah. But I'm going to take a Valium for this one. Yep. It's really, no, I don't know if you had an MRI, but it's very noisy and it's mm -hmm. you're in this little donut thing. And yeah, I had one about three months ago. Yeah. Well, not fun. No, it's not fun. So, yeah. And I, a friend of mine will come down with me, so. Great. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um... And did you say you've had your own near-death experience? Yeah, I have. On the 7th of May 1997 in London, I accidentally took around five to seven LSD tabs, yep. totally by accident. I mean, I did, intended to take some, but I, that quantity um, was a total accident. And I ended up <clears throat> having to go back to my room <clears throat> because I couldn't understand people speaking anymore and everyone was melting and... I couldn't understand English any longer and I just knew that I needed to be on my own so I convinced my friends to leave me alone and I went up to my room and fell into this deep meditative state where all that existed was the space between my breath mm. so it just got longer and longer and lo like so ridiculously long that and so peaceful and so beautiful between these breaths that I would just exhale and I just wouldn't take another breath in for what seemed like minutes and then the next thing I didn't have the the tunnel that is a textbook near death experience, but mm. I woke up on the other side in the white light, the typical textbook white light, having a conversation with God and them say them or him it, saying that I had to go back and me saying I don't want to go back, you know mm. I want to stay here. It's really beautiful here, and then um, they were adamant that it was not my time to stay there, and I got sent back and. When I opened my eyes, I expected to see everybody who ever loved me standing around my bed, but I was just in my room on my own, and um, 
and that had a massive impact on me because I I had never read about a near death experience. Mm. I'd never knew anybody. Death was not on my radar. I had no idea what a textbook near death experience was about. So I had like it's it's it it is and was so difficult to articulate the experience. Mm. Like the English language just took away like doesn't even come close to to explaining what it was like. So I then felt really disconnected from my friends and I really couldn't make sense of what had just happened. So um, I eventually found Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and just read everything that she ever wrote. And then I realized, like I worked out what had happened and um, put that in its place in my life. And yeah. um, and that's really what got me interested in, in death doulering and, and end of life because to make sense of that near death experience, I read so many books and then I just shelved them. Like once I made sense of it, and I also talked to some, um, some Vipassana teachers, like high up teachers, who said, no, no, that was a real experience. Because I think because I'd taken acid, I thought oh, I I was just tripping. But they said, no, no, everything that you explain is real. Like mm. thousands of people around the world have this experience, and it wasn't the highest possible experience that I could have because I still identified mm. as myself. Like I still had ego. So they were like, yeah, if you hadn't had ego, then that's the highest, you know, the highest near-death experience that you can have. High doesn't make sense, but yeah, yeah I think maybe you know what I mean. Deep. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and I, also talking to them really mm. helped because to be told by, you know, somebody who's into meditation and is really spiritual and obviously doesn't use drugs for them to be able to say, yeah, no, that's all, that all really did happen. That was quite... That was what I needed. I needed someone to say, no, what happened to you was mm -hmm. real. Confirmation. And millions of people around the world have had near-death experiences and there's commonalities in all of them. So, yeah. yeah, so I feel pretty lucky to have had that and that really helped me to um, help my mum through her death because mm. I'm not scared of death because I know what happens when we die. Mm. But this time it's my own journey and I, I'm not scared of actually dying, but the process of getting there is heartbreaking yeah <laughs> and you know the people we leave behind mm. yeah my kids you know mm -hmm. I've got small kids 10 and 4 so yeah yeah do you want to tell us a little bit yeah so this is part 2 we uh, just had a little break before to um, speak to the oncologist <laughs> yeah just go and, go and do our little things but here we are we're back again so we're with Gypsy and Dave <laughs> and just getting into Gypsy's journey with with cancer and mm -hmm. yeah and all things existential <laughs> yes uh, so where we left it before we where were leave it off? The kids. We're gonna start talking about the kids yeah and yeah and just your your general insights around your own mortality and you know just through everything else that you've been involved in yeah you know. yeah well my kids are 10 and 4 and we've told them that mummy has cancer and I explained that I had to have my breast off. They really, uh, I mean, obviously my 10 year old understands, but I mm. really feel like my son's soul really understands what's happening. Like he gets it. Um, Cause he was constantly like, is your booby okay? Mm. You know, why do they have to cut it off? And being really like, cause I can no longer pick him up cause I've got a tumor in my sternum, which, you know, it was cracked. Um, anyway um so yeah so the kids know mm. and when we told treya she she screamed out no and i said what are you saying no about and she said i don't know um so it was a really interesting um reaction from her mm. obviously sanaya couldn't sit there, sit there and have a conversation like treya and i had but um you know there's been ongoing conversations treya's asked if he can die from cancer and I've obviously said yes and she asked me what kind of cancer mm. and I lied and I said I didn't know what kind of cancer exactly and she sort of went oh, okay so I thought that if she wanted me to wanted to know she would ask me so um, but then she we lined her up with extra support at school mm. from the principal and the counsellor and she has had sessions with the counsellor and when I asked her what she talked about it was about you know the fact that I'd had a scan and everything was okay and um, 
apparently she did talk about people dying from like she's fully aware that people can die from cancer yeah um and she has ad admitted to me once that she does worry about me dying mm -hmm. um but I, i've kind of tried to like there's a couple of kids books that i've got inside one's called the little star and it's about a star that comes down to earth and is a, a baby and then it gets old and then it dies and it goes back to being a star again so just with end of life themes and yeah well wow. yeah and giving them the opportunity to choose those books to read if they want to so and i also sort of showed her my big jewelry box and said you know one day when mummy dies this is all going to be yours you mm. know and she was like oh can i have a look through and so and like just the other day she's like oh one day that dress is going to be mine and i'm like hey you know i'm not going anywhere soon and she's like no no like i mean like one day not anytime soon so we sort of have had a bit of a laugh about it so yeah but you know like they're definitely where my heart breaks you know i yeah. feel like if it was just me dying and i didn't have kids then this journey would be a lot easier obviously I, i'm leaving my partner and my family but that doesn't feel hard compared to leaving my kids like and not even just the leaving but the fact that my kids story will be then be my mum died when I was 10 or my mum died when I was 15 or whatever mm. and them having to carry that story through their life yeah and I do know a fair few people who have had their mothers die young when they were young and and it had a massive impact like so ridiculously like parents who have died and just not even left so much as a letter mm. so you know i've been really adamant that i want to leave as much as i possibly can for them and have yeah. been doing that can you tell us a little bit about some of the things you have been doing for the kids and yeah i've done the grueling heart wrenching and also beautiful at the same time job of um buying them birthday presents every birthday until they're 21 yeah so that was at the time when i started the shopping i was also being pushed around in a mm. wheelchair because i just wasn't strong enough to be walking around the store so and i know the kids are a long way from 21 so we're not going to talk about what presents i oh, know we won't talk about what presents but so sanaya has like 17 presents mm. so he's only four sanaya trey is older so she's only got 11 presents but it's a fair amount of presents and I also have put together a coming of age box for both of them so one for Treya when she menstruates mm. and one for Sanaya around that same age so whatever age Treya gets hers Sanaya will get his yeah yeah so can you tell us a little bit about this coming of age box especially yeah. for women around yeah. menstruation and yeah so what we know is that when we have major transitions and rites of passage in our life so when we are a young girl and we start to bleed and we're, mo we're moving into womanhood mm -hmm. we need to acknowledge and celebrate those rites of passage so that we convey to the person in the middle of it that this new life phase that they're moving into is valued mm -hmm. so becoming a woman is valued and the way that we can do that in our culture is to just give create a gift box so you know i i crocheted a blanket and i bought her um, some nice underwear and mm. I bought her a yoni egg and some menstrual pads like reusable cloth pads that she can use um, I bought her a journal that she can journal in a couple of books around menstruation and um, and also one on having a baby 10 moons about pregnancy and having a baby in case she has a baby and what else have I put in there like a hot water bottle mm. for a tummy if she's got t tummy pains I can't put oils and stuff like that because they'll expire but yeah yeah um, oh, I got her a beautiful um, macrame necklace made in red and so these are just little things that she can use and you know I won't be able to be there I might be able to be but chances are I won't be there to be able to give that to her so my sister's minding all of those things and and in Sanaya's there's again a crocheted blanket a ceremonial knife mm. so um, a beautiful knife that was engraved a journal a couple of books by D um, David Dieter um, I can't remember what else is in his, but yeah, both really important. Mm. Like they're, it's like a treasure trove. Yeah. And a letter to her about what it means to to be menstruating and what my wish for her as a woman. Yeah. So they were really, like there were lots of tears shed in the writing of those letters and and the getting together of the presents. But I really think that, you know. I, I want my kids to know that I did all I can for them to remember me, particularly mm. my boy who's only four. Like, the thought of me dying and him not remembering me is just fucking heartbreaking. Like, 
I might not look like it now, but I've cried my absolute heart out with just the mere thought of saying goodbye, especially to my boy and to Treya, you know, she's only 10. So yeah, so at least they'll know and there's, I printed off photos and laminated photos for them for some of the earlier presents and yeah. So. It just absolutely warms my heart <laughs> that you've been able yeah. to take us and obviously everybody listening through that, yeah. that process and that journey, you know, because yeah. like me, if I haven't done or heard of that thing before, just hearing about it. Yeah. Is, I mean, I, th- I think that people should be doing this for their kids, whether they're dying mm. or not. Like, every child, every young woman who bleeds, if she was given this amazing treasure trove of goodies, mm. then she would go into her womanhood and, and feel about bleeding. She would feel good about bleeding, not shame and feeling dirty or, you know, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. So, that would be my wish, is that more, more people do this for their kids girls and how their much, boys how much shame could we avoid you know by oh, yeah, bringing totally. some of these difficult conversations out mm. into the public yeah out into the open spaces and, yeah. and just sharing you know some of the emotions that we often trap and yeah. store deep in our bodies and yeah you know yeah because body shame and menstrual shame starts at the start you know mm. yeah and i think it's really important like in both boxes will go a jar of coconut oil to yep. teach them that self-pleasure is actually acceptable and a really good thing to be exploring mm. um yeah so i think that it would be really amazing to raise kids that don't have shame around their own pleasure and their their body's capabilities you know mm, absolutely so yeah so i'm hoping that i'm hoping that they both love them <laughs> and speaking of shame and grief mm. anger you know, and some of these raw and difficult human emotions. Mm. Have you had a bit of an insight into your own journey, you know, being faced with your own mortality and, you know, bringing these unprocessed things up for healing? Is there anything that surprised you? Or? Um, I'm, su- I'm surprised at the, the depth of the grief, mm. like, and, and that comes from having children. So... Like getting diagnosed has made me totally fall in love with my kids in a way that I, you know, I've always loved them, but mm-hmm. I've just totally fallen in love with them in this most profound, deep way, and it's excruciating. Like being a you're a dad, being a parent is excruciatingly painful because we, we stand to lose our children one day, mm-hmm. and that, it's saying goodbye to them is just inconceivable. How how that all happens. And yeah, so that's that's what has struck me, the absolute heartbreak. Oh, there's a crow being chased by some noisy miners. <laughs> um, oh, cute. You should just fly away and be done with it. <laughs> um, no, it wants to hang around. Yeah, so... Crows are a bit of a death messenger, aren't they? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I'll go and look up crow medicine when we're finished. But... Um, yeah, I mean, I've been working with a counsellor, as you know, around trauma, mm. because I do believe that, that cancer has an emotional element, as does every illness. So um, I've been working with her around some trauma. So, And, you know, when I look back on my life, I've had a lifetime of trauma, as have, you know, and this is not necessarily massive traumas where I've witnessed murders or I've been, you know, raped, violently raped or anything like that. You know, I've, I have been sexually abused in a couple of occasions but not you know I feel like I've healed that but there's been so many small traumas that Mm. have accumulated over my life and that I haven't had a chance to grieve so working with Tracy that's what we're doing we're looking at the big and the small traumas that Mm. are still alive for me and um, unpacking those Um, we never get crows here ever have I ever seen in 10 years a crow in my garden and there's yeah, one just today. sitting up there. <laughs> it's so appropriate. It is. Yeah. There are, you know, yeah. nature's got many messages. <laughs> it does. Many synchronicities. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess, I guess, yeah, my own trauma, how alive that can still be, is, mm. is one of the things, and the heartbreaks of the kids, and just um, uncertainty, like getting a prognosis and you know my days are numbered whether that's 500 days Mm. or 5,000 days my days are numbered and just living with that uncertainty is really quite the challenge yeah and I know that we're all dying and we all are uncertain about when our death day will come but 
you know, knowing that you're actually going to die and that could be in the next two years, it's really, it's really hard to, and it's really hard to hold, like I'm still living and I'm still really present to living mm. and I'm also dying and yeah. how to, like it's, it's like you're holding opposing sides, you know, you're holding them at bay or holding them, juggling them in your hand. Mm. Like how do I honour and not, you know, not deny that I'm dying, but also keep on living. Like it's really, yeah. it's, it's really hard. And some days it's just like, I've had days where I've just cried and cried and cried and cried and just cannot stop mm. crying. And then other days where I'm having so much fun, it's like, I forget that I have a diagnosis and yeah. then I remember again and then it's heartbreaking all over uh. again. So it's like the happier I get, the more surreal it feels mm. like it's really, it's been a year. And it's still so surreal. Like, I just feel like someone's just going to come and pinch me and they'll be like, ha ha, tricked you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really bizarre. I don't know. And I think that, I just think that our brain really cannot fathom our mortality, really. Mm. I, I think we think, we think we can, but I don't think we really can. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Mm. I think uh, the time, around the time we met, I was really starting to get a grip on, you know, how elusive the ego can be. Mm. And we can feel like we're saying the, the right things, you know, but actually really feeling them and really doing them. Mm. You know, you sometimes can be brought to that divide, mm. you know, that gap. Yeah. And, um, yeah, sometimes I think that's the, the ego just coming in, yeah. you know, softening those blows and yeah, you know, yeah, keeping sure. us wound up in cotton wool and just... yeah adding that little blanket layer of protection yeah like the, our ego wants to think we'll be here forever yeah because it's so special <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah no. wow <laughs> so yeah. you want to touch a little bit more about you know your insights around mortality and you know like especially when you're talking oh. about your counseling before is that brought in a new sense of letting go you know in terms of the processes around counseling that you're doing now and you know compared to in the past you know with all your you know shamanic journeying and yeah, I don't know how to answer that really, actually. I mean, my counsellor has survived a, ca a cancer diagnosis, so I feel like she really gets me. But mm. we've been, what I've the mo most enjoyed about working with this woman is that she is working with my shamanic stuff. So as I was explaining to mm. you today, when I take my medicine, I imagine that there are little Mustang horses, like wild horses in the medicine, and it goes through my body and finds a cancer and when it finds it, it stamps on it and like kicks it and mm. destroys the cancer. So it's been amazing for her to work with my spirit helpers. And, and as I was telling you earlier, that, that the first trauma that we worked through was a past life trauma. So yeah. it's been really amazing. Like I've seen so many counselors in my time, mm. um, some atrocious and some fantastic, but I've never had one that's mm. been willing to work with a past life and to bring in all my spirit helpers and I mean she's indigenous so that probably does help because she gets it you know um but yeah it's been it's it has I feel like it's allowing me to be more in living than dying yeah and you know we're not denying that I'm dying because last week we talked about getting um doing some end of life planning so as you know I just put on Facebook a call for anybody who wants to be on team gypsy at the end so when I'm too sick to look after myself and I need people here. So we've got a long list. I'm starting, you know, a list of mm. names, phone numbers, emails of people who will put their hand up and they're people, some people I don't even know. Yeah. And you know, that, that could be help with shopping or whatever. Mm. And so that has been part of my counseling. Um, Tracy suggested that I do that. And the purpose being that I can then shelve it. So all the, as much as I possibly can plan, I can do it and put it on the shelf and Absolutely. the rest of my time is for living. And, you know, I've been trying to have a thing to look forward to every month. And with the kids, um, you know, trying to create as much fun as I possibly can so that mm. when they look back on this time when mummy was sick and mummy was dying, that actually uh, in tied in and entwined in, in that grief was also happiness and joy. Mm. So, yeah. And I, I, pro I probably haven't had a good cry in probably three or four weeks, so that's pre I'm probably due one. <laughs> about due, yeah. Definitely I'm about due, but it's been it's been good to be in more in joy than heartbreak, mm. because there'll be time for heartbreak, and that's not so much now. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. And to realise that process is okay when it comes to yeah. 
it can be it can, the depth and breadth of it can be terrifying like mm -hmm. I'm not scared of being dead but it, the path to getting there like there's so much uncertainty like will I have seizures will it go to my brain and will I have seizures you know mm. does ha does having lung cancer hurt like I know that I, there's no need for me to be in pain but I'm kind of like what does that look like will I be able to walk around my house or will I be in you know you know just how that will look yeah so yeah I don't know and I try not to think about it too much but I think you kind of also have to mm. well like mm. making those lists you yeah. know making sure you're prepared for the people that can be here to support yeah support you through that process yeah yeah and I want to make more videos I really do I, I feel like when I got diagnosed I felt like I felt like I was a really obvious person to get a diagnosis because I'm quite well known in my community for the work that I do and mm -hmm. um, you know I guess I have some influence on some people and I just really wanted people to pay attention and to go and have like one woman on Instagram messaged me and said thank you for being so honest about your journey because I went and got a lump checked out and it is breast cancer and I would not have gone unless without you urging me to go and I'm so thankful because she caught it early and um, so you know I feel like I actually feel like more and more people young people will be getting diagnosed and mm. I think that it's the earth is sending us the message that we really need to sort our shit out we need yep. to stop eating all these chemicals and stop being in Wi-Fi constantly and you know I feel like my journey I hope will awaken a few mm. other people you know, I'm young. I'm young and otherwise healthy, in my in the prime of my life, and here I get this diagnosis. So yeah, yeah. Mm. I see evidence of waking up. You know, prevalent around us everywhere. But you know, my question is always: Is it enough? Is it fast enough? <laughs> yes. Is it fast enough? I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know the answer. But I, you know, I I have heard people say that in 50 years everybody will have cancer. Mm. of some sort and that's just terrifying yeah, yeah. and you know mm. to think we can have this conversation now would that be enough to all of us come together to create what change is necessary mm. you know in order to start behaving properly and yeah. going in the right way yeah you know yeah so thanks for like offering to hold the space for for our chat it's really, it's really important to yeah it's me. a pleasure and I think it really yeah. feels like it opens up to yeah you know, definitely more discussions in future to mm. create more space, you know, for people to have these conversations. I think it's really important. Yeah. I'd also like to find a way that people can ask questions as well. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously that would be do a live, a live um, feed. Well, how about we put this online and we just get a bit of feedback from this video. And yeah, yeah, yeah. people would like to actually see a live yeah you know sort of format yeah uh, for open participation i think that's a really good idea yeah um obviously with technology now we can facilitate that really easily we yeah, can we can sure. live stream yeah. uh, people can comment mm -hmm. and um you know we can open up this conversation to you know to, to our culture yeah and um and to our children yeah <laughs> you know i think that's where the biggest work's been done and i'm yeah. so proud of you gypsy for mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything you've been doing, you know, your yeah. your entire process, you've been taking all of us through this process. Yeah, it does definitely feel like a communal event. <laughs> yeah. And thank yeah. you so much on behalf yeah. of so many other people like that woman yeah. that went and got Yeah, yeah, totally. That's went amazing. and got checked. Yeah. You know my immediate reaction to everything that you've been posting about your journey has mm. just been, you know, one of complete warmth, heart opening mm. and you yeah. know, just yeah. Mm -hmm. gratitude for, for sharing that yeah you know because then we can all you know hold together a little stronger for people say like people have said you know thanks for sharing and stuff and how amazing it's been and I'm not sure what's amazing about it like is it because people aren't just don't want to talk about death or is it because people are generally quiet about their life struggles or what what is it like I don't understand what's so special about it I think you know I, know. I guess the my answer to that would mm. be that you know people have people operate on this approval rating mm. you know and we're always trying to look good in the public eye you know and the things that we're shameful about we're trying to hide away and stuff yeah, in the corner okay. and put in a box yeah and death's and not so pretty is it really? death's not so pretty disease is yeah. not so pretty illness yeah. is not so pretty yeah you know and yeah, so. i think people are just struggling to feel 
you know, loud and proud mm. about, you know, the things that we're, we haven't been so good at as a culture. Yeah. Until now, you know, we're getting better. Yeah. Yeah, true. Mm. Yeah, thanks, honey. Pleasure. Mm. <laughs> I just feel the gravity of how, um, you know, how precious your moments are. And, you know, mm. thanks for choosing to yeah. spend some of those moments with me and, yeah, yeah and having this beautiful. conversation. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Cool. Mm -hmm. Check you soon. Mm -hmm.